I myself am not a picky eater. I love trying new and exotic foods, and so going to Fiji, what the, liking the food wasn't a challenge for me. I just, I loved it, and I enjoyed it the whole time, and I still miss it to this day. But, uh, I mean, there are still quite a few missionaries that they'll, they'll struggle to get used to the food or, or not like it, and um, I, I think anyone can learn to like it. It's, it's good stuff. I just, I love it. Uh, so as far as eating with Fijian members or Fiji, the Fijian native Fijian people, well, I guess the main things would first be cassava and dalo. Um, or let's see, dalo is a Fijian word. Taro's, I think, the more known word for that in English. And cassava is the English word that I know of, but in Fijian known as tapioca. They're both root crops and you plant them and you just pluck out this big old bulb from the ground and you peel that, boil it or cook it in a, an oven type thing and it's, I mean, not, not a whole ton of flavor there, kind of like a potato I guess, doesn't taste like a potato but similar in like texture and just being more of a starchy filler type of food. Um, but I, I love it, I think it's really good. And you'll pretty much have one of those with just about every meal you have with a Fijian. Um, some uh, possible alternatives are also like breadfruit or uh, a couple other root crop type things, but all pretty similar. Um, but then that's normally just what you eat with whatever your main thing is. I, I'm pretty sure any RM that hears this is first going to think Roro. Roro is the, the leaf of the dalo plant, and it's cooked up and kind of boiled in a little bit of water most commonly, I think. And if you just have it plain straight like that, uh, kind of comparable, I guess, to a, a cooked spinach. But um, if, it's, if it's cooked all the way, it's, it's really good. If it's not quite cooked thoroughly, though, it's pretty rough to eat because it is actually really itchy and irritating when you swallow it and your mouth will just be scratchy and your throat will feel scratchy and it's it's pretty miserable if it's not cooked all the way which happens a little little more often than than you might think but I, i'd still say most of the time it was pretty good for me um and then fish, lots of good fish, just whether you're, if you're on the coast, a lot of good ocean fish, or if you're up in, in the interior of the islands, a lot of good fish from their rivers. And, and a lot of the time, I think my favorite is just cooked in coconut milk. You know, they'll scrape out a coconut and make the milk and just pretty much just boil it right in that. And it's, oh, it's so good. I actually, that's one item I learned how to make and I've made it a couple times since being home. You're just cooking coconut milk with a little bit of salt and a little bit of a, a moly type of like lemon lime fruit added in with that and it's it is good it is just delicious so uh, those are those are the most common typical Fijian food items they'll make like other stews and have chicken and other stuff with it as well um, as far as it goes with Indian food, curry. Curry, lots and lots of, of curry. And I, again, a lot of missionaries get pretty sick of it, but I loved it the whole time and I miss it. Uh, I mean, pretty much whatever item they could think of, they'll make it in curry, whether it be chicken or, or lamb or um, egg. I think egg curry was one of my favorites. You don't have to worry about the bones. That's another thing. Both Indian and Fijian meals, they just kind of chop up the whole thing and you, so you get the bone all the time and you got to learn to pick out the bones as you eat, even with fish. That can be a challenge at first. <laughs> um, but lots of curry. Um, and then that's normally on rice with, with roti, a little flatbread, kind of like a tortilla that you use to eat it with. Or... They'll do like a, a spiced rice sometimes, just called palau. And it's really it's really quite tasty. Sometimes you might accidentally bite down on a big chunk of a, a spice and it might just 
like explode your mouth, but it it's really good. I I, I love all the food there. <laughs> um, as far as customs go, I mean, you you eat with your hands in most meals, and wash them off in a little bit of a bowl or maybe in a sink, but you eat with your bare hands a lot. And it's, it's kind of weird at first, but I really grew to enjoy eating with my hands. And everyone there will tell you it tastes better when you eat with your hands. If you eat with a spoon or a fork, it just doesn't taste as good. So that, that's what they very strongly believe. And eh, I don't know if I know too much a difference between the two, but they taste similar. So that, I'd say that's the general food. As far as what most missionaries themselves eat in their flats, most common meals chow it's just like a, a ramen noodle type of thing it's eh, it's a pretty heavy staple in the, the missionary diet when they make their own food but that it's it's a really I, I love them so not a whole lot in terms of desserts if you're in the main towns you might get pies which are just kind of like a crust with a custard on them but don't get excited they're actually typically really bland just kind of like dry crumbly stuff with a flavorless kind of flub on the top. They're not the most flavorful. Every now and again you'll have someone make one that's that's got some more sweetness to it and it's it's pretty good. But uh, other desserts, um, uh, they do have their own ice cream factory there in, in Suva and so there's there's ice cream everywhere. You can get ice cream. But Typically dessert or anything like that would just be the fruit. Lots of, oh, how did I miss the tropical fruits? I mean, it's Fiji. It's tons of good fruit. Uh, yeah, if you like mangoes, you're in for a treat. Um, but my personal favorites, I really liked passion fruits and guavas. Not not the white kind. They have like the white kind that's more bland, but then they have like the the wild pink guava. Uh, that one is the good one. So look out for that if you can get it. <laughs> like within the city, um, particularly Suva, if you're on the south end or the, the east end of the island, typically you get a lot more rain there, like much more heavy rain there. And then you get a lot more sun and just direct heat in the, the north and the west part. So Suva itself is on the south end. And now, sorry, the other larger town area there, they, they get quite a bit of rain. And during the wet season, what would be like December, like November through uh, April or so is like the wetter season. Um, you, you can have days where you'll go outside and the sun is shining and it's clear and within an hour you're being downpoured on with a heavy 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 rain and you'll be drenched in seconds if you don't have your umbrella and then after a few more minutes it'll turn back to sunny and it'll just get really humid and muggy because it'll get really hot and evaporate all that water but then it'll just dump rain again and so it can be very on and off rain in that wet season and then on wet season I mean you're still likely to see rain once or twice a week so it's Lots of rain. Lots of rain in that city area. Um, we pretty much just carried an umbrella all the time. Even if it was a sunny, bright day, clear sky, we took an umbrella with us. So you just never know. So weather was pretty fun like that. Um, as far as in the city goes, there's... I'm pretty sure mostly just the zone leaders and the assistants there have vehicles that they can drive. The rest are all walking or taking buses. Um, the buses there, they're getting nicer and nicer, but there's still some of the buses that are just kind of a rugged bus, no windows, just like open sides and, and you take those to get around your area. Um, there, there also are taxis, they're, they're pricier and we'd normally only use those in emergencies where we really have to get back, otherwise we're going to be late or if we're in a rush to get somewhere. And eh, was, I don't know. I don't think they'd be as scary as any New York taxi or anything. So they're 
I mean, some drivers might be a little more scary to drive with, but that, that'd be the most transportation in that area, pretty much just walking in buses and taxis. Housing in the towns, most of the time you have, uh, the, most of the buildings are cement. They're like large cement structures that'll have, you know, one or two, maybe three separate flats in them that there'll be like the one owner that'll live in one of them and then rent out the other ones and that's the most common housing situation in the towns I think um, some of the ones in the main town can be really nice some okay uh, I'm pretty sure most of the flats now have heated water in them for showers they, it's like in a separate electric unit they have to install in each shower but the mission I think put the effort into getting those in most flats um, so that's that's like the general housing in the cities that's that's the most part it, within the main cities too though there's a lot of areas that um, we kind of call them like squatter settlements which are really just like uh, they're the, they're the poorest of the poor they find whatever scrap metal and wood they can and they build uh, pretty makeshift homes and um, they will fight for any job that they can to just keep afloat. In the main town areas, there's a lot of jobs, but a lot of the poor people will sometimes be um, hunting for jobs a lot or doing cheaper labor stuff. As far as like occupations and wages go, they're generally pretty low. I'm pretty sure like the Fiji minimum wage is around like two bucks an hour. And the Fijian dollars, about half of an American dollar. So, like, they'd only be making maybe it one American dollar an hour working there, and depending on what jobs they had. Um, so, th there's a wide variety. There's areas in Suva that are very wealthy, and you'll find very nice homes. Um, and those would be like. Sometimes, a lot of the time, like wealthy, the wealthier business owners there in Fiji, or or people from uh, like Australia or New Zealand that are living here, and then you'll have a lot of mostly that that middle area, the kind of basic concrete structured homes, and then you'll have those squatter settlements, as far as the scale goes, and that that'd be like the main town area, but again, that that differs quite a bit outside of main town areas. Lots of stray dogs. Lots and lots of those stray dogs. Some that breed and you don't know how that even worked because I mean if, if you ever play Call of Duty Nazi Zombies and you've seen the Hellhounds there's some dogs that look pretty much just like that. I mean it, they're they're scary. <laughs> they're just like hairless, splotchy and pretty nasty. But I mean, there's still a lot of more normal looking dogs as well. And so they're, eh, I, I, I never had any major issue being attacked by dogs. For the most part, they're used to just being around crowds of people. Uh, I mean, there, there still are some homes that will have a dog and you have to be more careful around those ones. But um, I do know some elders that, were more aggressively attacked by dogs, but I don't think it's too common. As far as the town, that's like the main wildlife. Tons of birds and um, yeah, occasional cats maybe, but eh, not a whole lot of wildlife in the in the main town areas. Um, shopping wise. There's like four or five, maybe six main like market names that you'll find those markets in all the towns and all around. Uh, but they're, for the most part, pretty identical in terms of what they carry in prices. Um, some might on occasion be cheaper here and there, but uh, they're pretty much identical. As far as when I was there, uh, missionaries would be given... Uh, about hundred and fifty dollars of support every two weeks and that'd be used for the shopping and stuff 
depending uh, on the missionary. Some are a little more thrifty than others, but I mean that that that, that hundred and fifty can get you through the two weeks if if you're thrifty about it. It, it can be tricky sometimes if you want to eat more varieties and stuff because some things will be more expensive. Again, a lot of missionaries ate a lot of noodles because they weren't so thrifty and that's about all they could afford to do. Um, I don't really know how to describe it too much. I mean, you can get things like milk. It tastes a little bit different than what you get here. but And, and it comes in a a box and it's not refrigerated. It's a, like ultra superheated, and so and as long as it's in that box and sealed, it stays good for a pretty long time, actually. But, um, but I mean that can be a little bit more pricey to buy that milk. Um, you can get bread from the different bread shops, and and jelly and peanut butter are a little more expensive. But I mean, if you're thrifty with how you use it, you can have peanut butter jelly sandwiches for quite a while, and it'll last. Yeah, you just gotta be creative with food. I don't know. Keep yourself entertained if you're not being fed by members. I uh, I ate lots of tuna as well. I I love the canned tuna here. There, you come back here, and I still haven't found a brand of tuna that I like in the U.S. Now, it all tastes like metal to me. <laughs> but the tuna there is really good. Good one. Corned uh, beef. Corned beef and breakfast crackers. Lots of corned beef there. I really enjoy corned beef. I would buy that frequently. And that's probably one thing that helped me put on a few pounds, but lots of rice. You can eat a lot of white rice. That's a good way to keep yourself filled for cheap. So that, that, that'd be the generals of shopping and food that I ate. And from what I observed, most missionaries ate. If you're in... Uh, a certain couple select areas in Suva, they'll have access in their area to go shopping at cost you less, which is like kind of like a Costco type of thing where it's a lot of imported things from the U.S. or Australia that you can find some pretty good stuff there. I was thrilled when I found Golden Puffs and Marshmallow Mateys and standard cold cereals. They don't really have cold cereal in Fiji. But if you could get to that store, oh man, it was pretty expensive. It'd be like 20 bucks for a, a one of those big bags, the value bags of the Golden Puffs or the different, ma, was it like, I can't even think of the brand name right now. Whatever that brand is that makes those and like the Marshmallow Mateys and those things. Yeah. So you're lucky you can get that, but not too many can. I, I started in Suva, was my first area. And so I was in a, a nicer, you know, a, a little bit nicer of a flat. Um, we were a flat tied to our landlord was a member family and they were in our ward. And so that was really nice. And so, yeah, being in, being in the city and serving in the city is very different than serving outside of the towns or cities. Uh, but then like my second area I went to, um, uh, a more farming area that was all uh, had a lot of the Indian cane farms and things like that, but also had a, several villages around, and and so we had a branch there, and um, so it was smaller and it was very different, and we had to do a lot more biking and a lot more widespread moving as opposed to the city area. Then my third area, I was living in like a smaller town area but our area that we would mostly work in was up away in just a, a farming area and it was uh, a little more open and distant from from modernized society I guess and then I also had the chance I was a district leader there and got to do several exchanges with um, other areas in that district which were just as out there as could be clear out in the in the bush. I got the chance to help open an area in Nakawakawa and be part of uh, the ceremony where we opened up that village for the missionaries and so that was really cool and then the missionaries there stay in a 
a little bit more of a not as nice of a flat. I mean, it's it was built specifically for the missionary. It's a little wooden hut next to a member there, and they they had to go bathe in the the river and. Um, just getting to their flat had to trek through a long walk of just muddy jungle. You almost have to take your sandals off at parts and you'd be into mud up to your knees at a few points trying to get through it. So it was a really exciting jungly bush area there and so I got to just have my fun experiencing that on exchanges and stuff but then uh, and then my last area I was in closer to a, a bigger town area but we worked even further up in the bush and so so it was really fun English is the national language the main national language it's like the lingua franca it's the one that you know everyone mostly communicates with amongst I mean in terms of like business settings or in the government and stuff because it's it's the common language amongst everyone um, and then, then you have like the native Fijians that speak the Fijian and Indians that speak Hindu as well. But then you'll also have on both ends of that scale as well, there will be a lot of Fijian p people, particularly ones further out in the bush, up in the, the mountains or further away from main towns that won't know English as well, and some probably not at all. And so you, you don't let anyone convince you you don't have to learn the language, you do. Um, and then same on the Indian side as well, there will be, particularly amongst the older generations of the Indians, they, they might not know English or speak, be able to speak it too well. Um, but for the most part, most can speak it pretty decently. They, they speak more of a British English since it was the British that colonized Fiji. And so it's more similar to the English in Britain, Australia, and New Zealand. Uh, I, re I had a lot of companions and fellow missionaries from New Zealand and Australia where we'd have fun comparing like English differences between those, but a lot of those words weren't necessarily used commonly in Fiji. They're, they're friendly, they'll, they'll ask questions culturally and stuff, they'll like ask questions and say things in a simple greeting and a first time meet that like would come off kind of creepy or weird in the US. I mean, you'll, you'll meet someone and just be like, Oh, hey, how's it going? And they're like, oh, good. Where are you headed? Oh, I'm, I'm going this way, or I'm going to town, or I'm going back to the, the village. And they're like, oh, okay, where are you from? And like, just very first meeting, I mean, they're super friendly. And it's it's totally not weird there at all. It's, it's perfectly fine, and I really enjoyed it once I got used to it. Um, and so uh, that was some of the main things. They'll ask questions, ask where you're from, where do you stay, where do you live, and well, I don't want to say where I live, but and and you don't want to be too specific, but I mean you can just say a general area, and they'll be happy with that. So uh, I mean that, that that that's one of the main things was not so much like particular words or phrases, but how conversational they'll be or how friendly they'll be in even just a first time meeting. I came back to the US and I was like, I gotta be careful how I talk to people. <laughs> I don't wanna come off creepy. The food in Fiji, um, it's a whole lot different than, than what I was used to. A whole lot of root crop, whether it's cassava or um, or a uh, dalo, both root crops, like a potato, very starchy. Um, chicken, fish, beef. I ate a lot of chop suey, a lot of chop suey. I like chop suey. Um, <laughs> um, oh, and something else I forgot. There's also a large Indian population in Fiji. So you'll get a lot of curry which I love curry too. And I haven't found a good curry since I've been home and that's been a long time. So lots of, uh, of Indian dishes along with the native Fijian dishes. So I, I gained a lot of weight on my mission, I will admit that, and I couldn't fit back into my suit coming home. So I never worried about starving. <laughs> um, yeah, a lot of, uh, 
it's really flavorful food. Um, I also loved um, the earth oven, the Lovo. It's where they dig a pit and um, put rocks, start a fire, put rocks in there, wrap the food up in uh, uh, palm tree leaves, put it back on the hot rocks, you cover the food, you wait a couple hours, you unearth it and you eat it and it's some of the best tasting food known to mankind. Way better than in and out It's, it's, it's awesome. Um, See what else? Yeah, the food. The food's great. I. Yeah, just keep when you're there. Just keep your mind open. That's that's my number one advice. Just keep your mind open, and um, you will enjoy it. I guarantee you, you'll enjoy the food. And when you come home, you will miss the food. I still miss it, and it's been a long time. Um. Yes, yeah, so lots of root crop. Lots of um. Yeah, chicken, beef, fish. Um, you can't find pizza over there. Can't find. And there is a McDonald's in Nandy Town. So if you're really craving your Big Mac or whatever, and you're on, and you're in Nandy, you can go to the McDonald's there. Yeah, and there's pizza and and um, yeah, McDonald's. What else? Yeah, so the food isn't bad. So you'll be all right. You'll survive. You'll survive. For the most part, I would say Fiji is, is very safe. Um, I, never once was I ever stuck up um, or uh, robbed or anything like that. But one thing that you will see over there is uh, a lot of the, the homes, the, the private homes, they're fenced off. And they'll have a regular uh, chain link fence. And then right at the top, there will be um, barbed wire. A lot of the homes and those gates will be locked. A lot of the homes will have bars over the windows because there is um, robbery. Robberies do happen. Homes do get broken into. Uh, when I was serving in Latoka, um, which is a city on the western side of the island, just right north of Nandy, I was, uh, we were, me and my companion, we were coming home and, um, we saw someone in our compound trying to break into our, into our flat and we were able to scare him off. And this guy, I don't know how he did it, but he jumped the fence with the barbed wire and, and took off. Um, there was another time in Latoko also, we were, uh, proselyting were out and um, someone had got robbed. I can't remember if it was a member or whatnot, but we were, someone got robbed and me and my companion, we don't do this, but we ran after the guy. <laughs> we ran after him and, um, and uh, we lost track of him. We don't know what happened. He took a left and we went right and but for the most part, the country is safe. Um, even when you're out in the middle of the sugar cane patch on a dirt road, um, you'll be safe. There might be a pack of, of wild dogs that might be roaming, which is, uh, during my time, it, it was common. A pack of wild dogs, which is very scary. But, <laughs> but it, it's safe. It's safe. In the city, it's safe. In the country, it's safe. Um... I would say in your flats, just make sure you lock everything up. If you can't lock your doors, if you have any kind of cabinets, put your personal belongings, make sure you lock them up. Um, if you have, you know, if you have your nice fancy shoes that you, you know, brought from America, um, I would suggest you don't bring them. Or if you have some real nice sneakers, don't bring your Air Jordans. Don't, you know, because um, the possibility that that they might walk off, like anywhere else. Um, let me see. Um, yeah, that's really that's really it about crime and safety. You'll be safe. You you really will be safe. Don't don't worry.
um, you won't need a nightstick or anything or mace or stun gun. <laughs> you'll, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. Rugby is huge. That's pretty much like a holiday too. Uh, rugby is, is, it's big. So we have American football, basketball over there. It is rugby. So when I was on, let's see, it was 95, it was a 95 World Cup and um, trying to teach a discussion during the uh, Rugby World Cup, it was, it was difficult. Every home that had a TV you'd go into, it was pretty hard to teach a discussion just because the rugby was on. And, um, and rugby is, is the national pastime. And, um, but it's a great sport. And you might play it a whole lot on P-Day, um, which it's a fun game. You have to deal with that a lot. But it's a good thing. <laughs> and guns are illegal. So you don't have to worry about getting shot or anything or having guns pointed at you. Because there's none. The military might have some, but you'll never see a gun anywhere else. Uh, but in, in the main city area, you do want to be careful. Uh, particularly when it gets dark out and in the later part of the evening. Um, I don't know, generally the mission guidelines and the gu mission guidebook are pretty good to keep you safe. You know, you know, change your routes, don't walk the same route every day, and and just just use caution and stuff. And if you don't feel good about an area you're in, just get out. I mean, they're, they're I, I'd say the most common. I don't think anyone was really ever attacked, but I mean, there were flats that would get robbed here and there. And so be sure you lock your door as well and hide away valuable things. Um, but for the most part, a lot of the flats are pretty secure. I mean, most most homes in Fiji have like bars on the windows and and a lot of fences and gates and stuff in the main town area. So that that'd be the biggest issue, I think. Um, there are. In a lot of the main city areas, if you're walking around late at night, you might find a lot of people that, or people here and there that are completely drunk and wasted, and you might want to be careful. For the most part, I don't think any were too threatening, but there were a couple times we were more aggressively, angrily spoken with, but a lot of people, even if they don't like the Mormons or they hate the Mormons, they realize that were missionaries and they have a respect for us in that way and so most people will respect the missionaries if they talk crap about them behind our backs like at least to your fit generally they're really respectful and so you don't I don't think there's a whole lot of too much concern about safety or being attacked but I mean they're you still want to be cautious um, I love how friendly they are if you're walking on the road and it's just you and you see another Fijian that's walking the opposite direction, you'll always say something to them. Right? They'll always say something to you, whether it be Iyo or Mbula or Salakamanu Bango, they'll say something to you. They'll always recognize you, they'll always say hi to you, they'll always say goodbye to you. And they're welcoming. If you're walking in the village, they always, it's cultured to invite anybody that walks past you to come join you at dinner or at lunch or breakfast. So you're walking in the village in the morning, um, you'll walk past an open door, you'll be like, my Munti, and you'll be like, Unaka, and be like, my local my, and then you'll say, no, I'm good, and they'll be like, all right, but they'll always invite you to come eat with them, and even if they don't have anything, they'll try to find something to give you. They're just generous, they don't care about uh, the temporal things in life so much, they don't care about money, they don't care about status or or wealth, they just care about their families, and they care about God and and about helping others out and because they know that those are the things that really give them happiness So I love that. I love how humble they are. They're just Willing to learn and to love I never met a Fijian that didn't like love you instantly and I don't know the love just grows and grows every time I got transferred. I cried. I didn't want to leave the people. They're just so nice and um, Willing to help you out. I don't know. I've just never met a people that were so kind and uh, generous and and wanting to do what's right it's quite common for everyone sits on the floor um very common you might have 
a majority of your meals sitting on the floor. Uh, your discussions will be taught while you're sitting on the floor. <clears throat> so if I was to come in into a room and everyone's sitting on the floor, it's I need to get as low as possible. Um, Cause I don't want to be standing over anyone or perceived as looking down on anyone. So, so if I come into a room and I see that there's a spot to sit on the opposite side of the room, I'm going to come in and I'm going to bend over, hunch over, try to get my head as low as possible to someone sitting on the floor. And I'm going to say chulo, which is, excuse me. So I'm going to say, and, and if there's happened to be 10 people between me and that one spot on the other side of the room, they say, I'm going to say, excuse me, excuse me, until I get to that one spot and then sit down and fold my legs, Indian style, cross my legs and sit down. Um, yeah, so it's just chulo, 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 excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Um, Another thing is you don't want to, you don't touch anyone on the top of their head. So it might be customary here to, you see a little kid and you pat them on the head over there. Don't touch anyone on the head. You're not going to pat anyone on the head. So respect is very key. You don't want to disrespect anyone. You want to be coming into a home, be as humble as possible. If it's meal time and there's something that you may not be fond of for whatever reason. Do your best to set your pride aside and your taste buds and, and eat what they offer you because this might be the best that they have. And so kind of put your pride aside and, and you know, for me, it was fish. I wasn't a huge fan of fish, but in Fiji, fish is a regular part of the diet. And there's a few times I had to set my pride aside and eat some fish. I like fish now. I've kind of gotten over that. If there's any sister missionaries, this probably won't be a problem that you'll, that you'll deal with, but because your skirts will be long. But if you're female and you happen and you go into a village, um, maybe this is more if you're on vacation, if you ever go back on vacation, if you happen to be wearing a pair of shorts, that's a no-no. Um, make sure you have a long skirt that um, you know that you, that you can cover up. So if you, for instance, for instance, if you're you know on a P day and you're going to go, you might go into a village or a service project or whatever. Just make sure you have a, uh, a um, and just a long skirt to cover cover your legs all the way down to your ankles. Um, you'll see that in the village a lot. You know, a lot of ladies they'll wear long. Even in the city, just long skirts, you know, all the way down um, to your ankles. Um, 